Good morning. It's April the 18th, and I'm Robin Jacobson speaking from our home congregation in the sanctuary of the Trinity United Church in Vernon, British Columbia, where we meet on the unceded territory of the Okanagan Silk. Welcome to worship. Today we're making the last of the two required announcements advertising today's annual congregational meeting to be held online at 11 a.m. via Zoom, of course. You can access the meeting's link on our website if you are in time. The link is also included in our last two Friday e-newsletters. We begin our time of worship as always with the lighting of the Christ candle of peace. We do so in the hope of owning the peace that is always associated with our gathering in the name of Jesus Christ. May the peace of Christ be with you. We thank you, dear God, for the gift of this moment. We would allow ourselves now to quieten down, and enough so that we may become aware once again of your sacred self and of what our awareness of your presence actually means for us, both as individuals as well as as a community, a gathered and a gathering people a people who are called by you, who follow you. Praying these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our reading this week is from Luke chapter 24, from verse 36 through to verse 48, and is being brought to us by the Luma Project. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, 
This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is a presentation of the Word of God, a reading from the Word of God, and God always blesses the reading of God's Word. Amen. Today's text begins in a similar setting to that of last week, when in John's Gospel we read of how the disciples were gathered together in that upper room behind locked doors for fear of possible persecution from the, their various authorities. Those guys had killed their leader. Were they next? In Luke's gospel, today's text, Luke places them also in Jerusalem, but we're not told exactly where, just that they were gathered together somewhere when those two unnamed others who had just met the risen Christ on the road while walking to Emmaus had come to them and told them all about that meeting. They had spoken of how Christ had opened their minds to understand all sorts of things from Scripture and how their hearts had burnt with excitement as He spoke and especially as they recognized Him for who He actually was as the risen Christ. It must have been deeply unsettling for those 11 remaining disciples, 11, of course, after Judas had taken his life, for them to hear this, utterly unsure of what they were to make of it. Dare they begin to have hope? Dare they actually believe it? That Jesus is risen? And then while they were talking about this, we told, Jesus himself stood amongst them and said to them, Peace be with you. That is what he had said always would happen every time two or more are gathered in his name. Jesus is going to be right there. It's what happened in the upper room. It's what happened on the road to Emmaus as those two had been walking and talking about him. And it's what happened in today's text. It's also what's happening right now as we gather to worship, even online, gathering in the name of Christ. He is here. Then we told of those disciples' reaction as they realized his presence was with them, that they were startled and terrified, thought that they were seeing a ghost. Clearly, to experience Jesus' risen presence as something palpably, physically, tangibly, actually with them was not at all what they were expecting. Deeply challenging for them, taking them way outside of their expected comfort zones. But then he said to them, why are you frightened? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I, myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and he ate it in their presence. The question is, why did Jesus make such a big deal of emphasizing the physical reality of his presence? Sure, he wanted to communicate the fact that he was no longer dead, that something quite wonderful and miraculous had happened. But why not just let them believe it as a purely spiritual reality? Wouldn't that have been simpler? Wouldn't it have 
been enough for him simply to let them come into an awareness of him now risen as a spirit. Some powerful figment of the imaginations perhaps. Some rise of their consciousness. Why was it so important that they not believe that? And why is wanting to eat something? That piece of broiled fish, what is that all about? Certainly Jesus' resurrection body must have been very different in so many ways from his before crucified body. I mean, he could move through walls. And... But however it was different, Jesus was specifically wanting them and us to understand the sheer physicality of his resurrection. Why? I think it's because Jesus knows how our very human tendency is always, if not to ignore him, then superstitiously almost, somehow overly to spiritualize him. And I think we do so because we think that's, that's easier that way. We reason that if the risen Christ can be confined to being only spiritual, then it doesn't really matter so much how we live physically, how we treat others, even how we treat ourselves. So long as we are looking up and away towards worshipping some elevated something, some spirituality that we may call Jesus, but who is clearly way above and outside of our worlds, something over there. That's what a purely interventionist God would be like, remote, but who deigns to intervene by occasionally dipping into this world. That would be a God requiring us to bring our various acts of dutiful obeisance in order to keep it happy enough to grant us certain favors from time to time. Dear God, is that what we allow our faith in you at times to appear to be? Us believing that we can continue to live our physical lives however we want because it doesn't really matter so long as we keep that carefully portioned off religious bit of our spiritual lives clean and in order. Do we do that? Well, here Jesus is saying to those disciples and to us all that we can't do that. As a risen physical presence, he takes all of this a physical world very seriously indeed. The risen Christ is not outside of the everyday reality of our living. A very present and physical reality. Remember how in Matthew 25 he actually says it in so many blunt verses that whatever you have or have not done to even the least of these amongst you, you have or have not done to me. The risen Christ, a physical reality. The entire cosmos is, in this sense, filled with the wonderful presence of the risen Christ. And as we engage physically with it all, all of it, so we are being given insight here into how we have capacity to be engaging the risen Jesus Christ. Isn't that the point of Psalm 139, which asks, where can I go to be away from your spirit, your presence? If I go to mountaintops or into valleys, even in the utter darkness, dear God, you are there. Well, how about in the prologue to John's gospel that the spiritual word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Hey, dwells as the risen Christ amongst us. We have to understand this. It's an absolute key element of our faith. And it's right there. It's spun all through Scripture. I wonder to what extent it was just that which Jesus was explaining to those disciples on the way to Emmaus. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. The way of the risen Jesus Christ is a beautiful and holistic way 
of living where we are given to see His holiness and His presence in everything. Father Richard Ruhr repeatedly points out how our typical translation of the Greek word for the New that the New Testament writers use to describe our response to the gospel, metanoia, metanoiete, metanoiete, translating it as repent, is unfortunate as it does not have too much to do with our penitence as to do with our changing of our minds. Until the mind changes the way it processes the moment, nothing changes in the long term. And so be transformed by a renewal of your mind, Paul says in Romans chapter 12, which hopefully will allow the heart soon to follow. Evidence of the reality of the resurrected Christ is all around us. But because we are all so easily obsessed with just the superficial veneer of what we mistakenly insist is most important, we miss it. We miss him. Let me say it again. The holiness of God's love poured out in Jesus, made manifest in the risen Christ, and sealed by the Holy Spirit, insinuates itself into all of our physical world. If only we had the eyes, the ears, the hearts open enough to see and appreciate it. That's the point Jesus was making in virtually all of his miracles. We can almost hear his frustration in Matthew 13, where he says, For this people's heart has grown dull, their ears hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes so that they may, might not look with their eyes and listen with their ears and understand with their heart and turn and I would bless them. And then Jesus blesses us as we are given to be amongst those who are just beginning to respond with the grace that God intends. Where he says, but blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. Truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see, but did not see it. And to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. He's speaking about himself, risen, his presence. We sing it at Easter, Jesus Christ is risen today. But do we know that? Do we see that risen presence? Do we hear it? To what extent do we actually embrace it? To what extent do we actually live it? Oh my goodness. This is the stuff for which we are wired. It's for what we are all created to be as Christ following people of the resurrection. While yes, Jesus Christ certainly is risen today. In me, in you, and everywhere. Our sin is the brokenness that we allow from within ourselves and others to obfuscate, to smother our appreciation of that most beautiful and God-given, that most gospel-real reality. And we access that reality through the cross. It's as we allow whatever gets in our way to die with Jesus as he dies that this whole new appreciation of God's holiness everywhere is given to rise up in our awareness with the Christ as he rises. Imagine with me what more we could be and do as we grow in our appreciation of that wonderful truth with resurrection eyes so open that, for example, Instead of seeing our world's so many displaced and homeless refugees as threats, we are given to begin to see them as yet so many struggling nativity families. You know, looking for a home to birth their new lives. Instead of seeing just whatever we may choose to spin of what's going on around us, we get to see the risen Christ as actually part of our entire given reality. Instead of seeing our planet and all the universe, in fact, 
as something simply, simply for us to plunder and to abuse or ignore according to our greed or whim. We get to see it as the vessel, the holy sepulcher, the very bearer and revealer of Christ's risen presence, inviting our engagement and our nurturing stewardship. I think that is why Jesus chose deliberately to eat that piece of fish. He was wanting those disciples to have absolutely no doubt regarding the sacred physicality of his risen reality. A spirit does not eat. Our work then, surely, is to choose to stop whatever is going on within our own lives that traps us within a small and unholy view of creation with Christ as purely some spiritual something that exists somewhere else. I think perhaps that's mostly what we call sin. We can confess those things. We can confess that as we ask to be released into a deeper appreciation of this other infinitely more real and Christ-filled, risen Christ-filled reality. Dear God, we don't ever pretend to be getting this perfectly correct. But thank you that we don't have to, because in Jesus Christ, you always do. And that somehow, as we lean hard into your grace, committing ourselves to grow into ever-deepening awareness of you as our God, just doing our best, is somehow enough. Thank you. Bless you. Praying in Jesus' name, your amazing grace. Amen.
And so with multitudes of worshippers down the millennia, we confess our faith. That the same Jesus who once lived and died has now risen as the Christ. And by God's amazing grace now calls us to worship God by acknowledging and responding to his risen presence everywhere. May that be so. Amen. One of the ways that we worship the risen Christ is by taking God's good earth very seriously. Hello everyone. Earth Week is coming up. It's the time of year when we think of renewal, resurrection, new life. It's all around us, in our gardens, plants, animals. And the United Nations have designated April 17th to 24th as Earth Week. Also, the 51st annual Earth Day is April 22nd. There are many events during this time. The Ecumenical Christian Group For the Love of Creation is sponsoring a week of interesting activities around faith and climate action. You can go to their website for details of these events. Just after Earth Week on April 29th, you have a choice of two events. North Kamloops United Church is sponsoring a panel discussion called Changing the Climate on the Climate Emergency, featuring Wendy Evans, United Church Minister and Climate Activist, Adam Olson, Green Party MLA for Saanich North and the Islands, and Seth Klein, author of A Good War, Mobilizing Canada for the Climate Emergency. The second event on this day is sponsored by the David Suzuki Foundation. They are screening the movie, What About Our Future? This movie chronicles the sustainability teams, a group of young environmental activists who organized one of the largest protests in Vancouver's history. They say, young people have not yet made a commitment to the status quo, and so we can speak the truth with no hidden agenda. The film will be followed by a conversation with young climate justice organizers from across the country. Links for all these events can be found on the Trinity United Church website. In other good news, last Monday, the City of Vernon unanimously endorsed the Climate Action Plan and directed the city to begin implementing it. There is indeed much to celebrate. Thank you, Bill and Phyllis. Come, let's pray. Holy God, thank you that you don't wait for us to come to you, but that in the risen Christ, you come to us. In the beauty of your most awesome creation, may we come to see you clearer, love you more, serve you better. In this time of earth awareness, we pray especially against all of those forces within us and all of humanity that are still contributing to the destruction of your created order. The earth, the oceans, in the skies and beyond. As part of your creation, remind us of our sacred privilege, our duty, our responsibility to be nurturing partners with you and with one another as opposed to being just self-obsessed takers of whatever we can get. Dear God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray now for all those things that have somehow been allowed to darken our awareness of your presence, O oh God, in creation. Hear us now as you open our hearts to you in prayer. We think of those who have lost loved ones. We think of those who are particularly in mourning at this time. We continue to pray against this COVID-19 virus and all its variants. Praying for those whose lives have been so deeply affected, whether directly or indirectly, 
physically, spiritually, praying for the most effective development, manufacture, deployment of vaccines. Dear God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. I invite you to take a moment of silence. Now, as praying together, we lift up our hearts. Now drawing these prayers and all prayers, spoken, unspoken, even the groanings of our heart, drawing all together, we pray that Jesus, the prayer that Jesus taught, saying together, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I understand that Gaia was the primal Greek goddess personifying the earth. The Gaia paradigm, or also known as the Gaia theory or the Gaia principle, suggests all living organisms interact with the inorganic surroundings on earth to form a complex and self-regulating system that helps to maintain what we need for life on this, our shared planet. And so it's fitting that we close our service in this month honoring Earth Week and Earth Day with a special hymn. But first, the blessing. Go! May we all be made so much more acutely aware of the presence of the risen Christ within the physicality of this beautiful planet. Be very blessed by that awareness. Be used to share that awareness as you find creative ways to be the blessing to others and to our beautiful Mother Gaia, Mother Earth, as St. Francis said. That's us being the blessing that we are all intended by God to be. And as we do so, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you today, this week, and always. Amen.